I'm conscious of the fact that for the first time in my life, I think I'm color clashing with a Christmas tree. So I feel like I need to just stand on this side of the screen and, and then otherwise I could disappear if I stand over here. So I'll stand here. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Rich. Um, we've, uh, Megs and I have, have loved getting to know Richard and Catherine over the last uh, few months, I suppose. Um, and so uh, just to say to you, St. Michael's family, that uh, you are you are blessed with some of the best here. We have loved getting to know them and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak in this um, series that you've been doing. Um, just also, if you don't mind, have to say hello to a couple of people. I've noticed that my in-laws uh, have joined us and also, uh, obviously you've met Megs and the kids, but also uh, just to say hello to the Day family, who are mates of ours from South Africa, who have also uh, zoomed in for this, which is one of the joys of, of technology. Anyway, if, we're, uh, if you've got your Bible, we're in Ephesians 6. Um, you can turn there, as Richard said. Uh, it should go on the screen if my wife is managing to uh, share her screen. Is it working? Um, Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 20. Uh, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that my that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an, amb- an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, I'm going to pray if that's okay. Uh, God, I want to thank you for the, the power of your word. Thank you that uh, it is a combination of the truth of your word and the revelation of your love for us that changes our hearts. And so, God, I want to pray for each one of us uh, here this morning uh, together over Zoom. Lord, I want to pray that you would speak to us. I want to pray that you'd open the eyes of our hearts to see you. Why don't you just take a moment uh, just to ask God to reveal himself to you in a new way through his word. I'm just going to give you a moment to say to to have a moment with God to ask him to open your heart. God, I want to pray that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, this uh, imagery, uh, this chat, this kind of section of uh, of Paul's letter. Uh, comes at the end of his letter to the church in Ephesus. So I don't know if you've been with us for this series, but um, this is the sixth chapter. Um, it's, it's the end of the of the letter, and it's kind of at the uh, kind of conclusion, if you like, of, of Paul's uh, the Apostle Paul's writing. Um, just to give you a very quick overview um, of where we've come from. In chapter one, Paul opens up by praying for us. He prays uh, that the church in Ephesus, and therefore you and I, um, by uh, association, if you like, uh, would know the fullness of the blessing and power that is available to us in Christ. He prays at the start that we would have our eyes, the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that we would know the hope to which God has called us, that we would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And, with, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us? He goes on in chapter 2 to talk about the amazing grace uh, by which we have been saved. That we were far from God, dead and sinful in our ways, uh, blind to him. And that he, by his wonderful mercy and grace, has made us alive, adopted us, welcomed us into his family, established us in him. That we now have dignity and honour because of who we are in Jesus. In chapter 3, he talks about that 
the fact that we come together as a church, that he joins us with other people uh, and that each of us uh, come together and we overcome our differences and, and the, the gospel unites us in a wonderful way. And we can now, as a church, as a body, radiate God's love to the world. We can uh, display him, if you like, to others around us. It finishes that chapter uh, expressing the fact that we would be able to grasp just how deep and how wide God's love is for us. In chapter four, he talks about the fact that in this new life now uh, that we have in God, now we're new creations in him, that we would live in our new skin, in, that we would uh, be different, that we would live according to, to the new hope that we found, that everything now changes. And in chapter five, he talks about how that looks in the way that we love each other, in the way that we um, love uh, others and the way that we love uh, people in our relationships um, and in our in a, in a way that we parent in the way that we go to work all those sorts of things and we saw that um, two weeks ago uh, when Catherine and Richard were talking about how marriage looks now uh, in this new world and so if you'd written all of that if, if you were writing this letter what what would you what else is there to say uh, is there anything left? He feel, it feels like to me he's gone through everything, these great uh, truths of God and our relationship with him and how it would look uh, on a day-to-day -day kind of practical application. And in some ways, it feels like there isn't much more to say. Um, and I think, uh, as I was reflecting on this this week, I think the, the thing that he finishes off with isn't so much a conclusion or a wrapping up. But I think it's a reflection of how this all feels sometimes. And, uh, and what I mean by that is uh, Paul is writing this letter uh, under, under arrest. He's probably surrounded by soldiers. Um, he certainly would have been with soldiers recently. And he's writing all these amazing truths. And he's talking about how we love each other and how we uh, relate to each other. But Paul, I think, is staring sort of straight in the face the fact that this this Christian walk, this life that we live on this earth is a war zone. It's a battle. It's not easy. And uh, I don't know if you like a good battle scene. I don't know if, uh, what sort of movies you're into. Uh, one of my favourite all-time movies is Braveheart. I know it goes back a few years. It's kind of show, showing my age now. Mm -hmm. um, I went through a, a season of... Uh, <laughs> of showing Braveheart clips in kind of most of my sermons. I was a youth pastor, and so uh, I would uh, get Braveheart in there somehow. There is a, a moment in Braveheart where William Wallace is with his mates. They're on the side of a, a kind of mountainside, like overlooking a, a you know, wonderful valley. And, uh, and Braveheart, William Wallace, just turns to his mates and he says, are you ready for a war? And it was the moment where, because of the way that they kind of uh, been progressing as, as a group of people that they knew that they were about to encounter the English and war with them. And I think this is, in some ways, this is Paul's moment where he's turning around and he's saying to you and I as Christians, are you ready for a war? Like, are you, are you ready for the battle that is before us? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we don't wrestle, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly places. I just, I guess I kind of want to open up really and say, I, I think this year more than any other, it's probably fair to say that life has felt like a battle scene. <laughs> and Paul is saying, yeah, don't be surprised by that. Uh, it, it's not peacetime. Uh, it's, it's wartime. You know, we, we were looking at the, the story of, um, I mean, not the story, but we were looking at um, V-Day the other day, weren't we, uh, celebrating um, all those that have given up for our country, given up their lives, sacrificed themselves for the peace that we now enjoy. And, uh, and as we were reflecting back on some of those, I was, again, amazed at how wartime looked um, uh, just even for the families that were left here the, the sort of context that wartime uh, is for us and uh, and Paul is saying don't don't be lured into any false sense of security 
this is not peacetime, this is wartime. And you might turn around and say, but hang on a second, surely um, now I've become a Christian, now I've kind of given my heart to Jesus. Surely everything should go swimmingly now. Surely the BMW is kind of going to be delivered and the you know, job promotions are coming and you know, I've, I've aligned myself uh, with, with the truth now. I know Jesus, everything can, can go well from here. Well, you don't have to live for very long to know that, that that's not the truth. And, and actually you don't have to read the Bible for very long to realize that that's not promised anywhere. In fact, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an expectation that we would be dangerous to fall into. Uh, it seems fairly clear uh, from Paul's life and from what Jesus said uh, that in this world we would have troubles. And so the, one of the reasons we have uh, a war on our hands is because we have an enemy who's after us. And, uh, and I think that's the one thing that Paul wants to draw out in the midst of everything that's going on in the church in Ephesus. He wants the people and he wants you and I to realize that there is a, a devil scheming against us. It says that you may, uh, that you, we, you and I may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so we're in a battle, um, but we're in a battle with an enemy. Before you and I, if you're a, if you're a Christ follower, if you love Jesus, before you became a Christian, you were not an enemy of Satan. The Bible's quite clear that there are two, uh, there are two uh, kingdoms, if you like. There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, and you're in one of them. Whether, whether you like it or not, you are in one of them. You're either in the kingdom of light or you're in the kingdom of darkness. And when you and I became a Christian, when we joined God's family, uh, we, in effect, had war declared on us by Satan. And... Uh, and I don't know if you're aware of that. If, 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 if I, I'm not sure I live in the awareness of the enemy that I am uh, facing. C.S. Lewis, uh, the guy who wrote The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, he writes that uh, and argues that either people fall into one of two categories. Either they are people who ignore the existence of the devil um, or we are those who are unhealthily preoccupied with it. Megs, we're on the next slide now. Girl. We're on the, with an enemy bit. Um, and either those who ignore the existence of the devil or with those who are unhealthily preoccupied with it. And so I want to ask you, which is the danger that you're more, more likely to fall under? Are you, which side of that fence are you more likely to fall? If I'm honest, I think uh, for me, I'm, I don't have an unhealthy preoccupation uh, with the enemy, but I think I probably live uh, almost functionally as if he doesn't exist. And I think Paul is, is wanting to help us uh, see and understand the context of which we live our lives now. There is one who is real, who is against us. He desires to bring destruction. And if you're a believer, you're a target of his. Sounds a bit extreme, doesn't it? Sounds a bit dramatic, maybe. But uh, I'm not saying anything that I don't get direct from the words of Jesus. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, Jesus said at the end of his prayer, he, he said that this is how you should pray. He said, you should pray, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. How often do you pray like that? How often do you pray that God would protect you from the evil one? How often do you pray that God would protect you from Satan? That's not, I'll be honest with you, it's not an opening prayer or a common prayer of mine. We live in a, in a worldview, uh, the rational worldview is the kind of dominant worldview at the moment. Some refer to it as the scientific worldview. And the, the kind of scientific rational worldview would argue, uh, where's the evidence uh, that you're talking about? And, and kind of projects evidence and, and kind of physical uh, display as the, and physical evidence as the kind of primary value of its worldview. It's really important that as Christians that we never place this worldview above the authority of the Bible and the words of Jesus. Cranfield writes that the greatest achievement of the powers of evil would be to persuade you and I that they don't exist. We are all engaged in a spiritual battle. 
it seems from the Bible that the more involved you get, the more <laughs> dedicated to Jesus you become, the more the closer you get in your relationship with him, the more effective you become for the kingdom of God. It, the Bible seems to suggest the opposition only grows. Paul refers regularly to the impact that Satan has had on his life. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul writes that he was given a messenger of Satan to torment him. He talks in other places about the fact that um, we, he talks in other places about the fact that um, he was wanting to go into a certain place to preach the gospel, but he couldn't because uh, the devil stopped him. Jesus himself had an interaction with the devil himself, with Satan. Uh, if you know the story that for 40 days and nights, Jesus went uh, into the desert and it was there that the devil met with him and tried to convince him to turn away from the plans that God had for him. Not only did he tell us to pray for protection, but Jesus prays himself in, in the Gospel of John that we would be protected from the enemy. He says to Peter, uh, one of his closest friends, he says to Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. I always can you imagine being Peter in that moment? Jesus saying to him that Satan has asked to sift you. <laughs> I guess Peter would be sitting there thinking, I really hope you said no. <laughs> in 1 Peter 5, that very man writes, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We, uh, in, in South Africa, we were uh, privileged enough to encounter lions in captivity, um, you know, in zoos and things. Uh, but we also, more and more kind of specially, really, were able to experience them in their own habitat uh, on kind of safari drives and things like that. And it, they are amazing beasts. But there is nothing about a lion that would make me want to get anywhere near him uh, and hang out with him at all. <laughs> and, uh, and I think... Peter is wanting us to realise just how serious the threat is. It's helpful maybe to understand the number one desire of the enemy is to cause you to doubt God. I wonder if that is what we would have expected. See, the Bible doesn't define life and, and the kind of fullness of life as the amount of oxygen in your lungs. Uh, the Bible doesn't define life in the way that the world does. It doesn't define life even according to your physical health. That's not a definition of life as according to the Bible. The definition of life, as far as the Bible writes about it, is uh, to do with the closeness that we have to God. In, in, in Genesis, um, it's declared over Adam and Eve that they're dead now as they are excluded from God's presence. They are declared dead, even though they're still very much physically alive. But they're separate from God. And actually, the enemy's desire is not even to make you unhealthy or to kill you. The enemy's desire is to separate you from God, to cause you to distrust him, to cause you to doubt him. And he does it in, in a number of ways, but mainly he does it by lying about God. He does it uh, by accusing and lying. He's the, the father of lies, the prince uh, of lies. He's the accuser. And he'll use our own sin, he'll use doubt, and he'll use trauma in our lives to sow uh, poisonous seeds into your heart. And so when we fall short, when we sin, when we let God down, when we, we fall short of our own standard, uh, the enemy will come in and tell you that you're no good, that you can't, you can't live up to this life that, that God wants you to live, that you're not good enough, that you're not acceptable, that, you've, that you're alone now. You're not acceptable to God. And, uh, and if, if he can, he'll begin to sow doubt around you about the existence of God even. Maybe this has been a season over the last six months where you've had lots of time to reflect and think. And maybe the, the, the voice that the world preaches at us, that we're crazy for, for believing in a, a fairy in the cloud. Maybe that started to take root in your heart and the enemy would love to just continue to sow that. Don't believe in this made up fairy tale. I think another source that the enemy would use is trauma. I've, uh, I've been 
lucky enough not to really have experienced much trauma in my life, but I've been very close to those who have. And, uh, and I know how heartbreaking trauma and loss can be. I've, I've had the privilege of burying uh, friends uh, and taking their funerals and, and taking the funerals of friends' children. And, and I, I've held babies that, that have died uh, moments after I've held them. And, and so I've experienced something of the heartache of trauma. The enemy will use anything from COVID to cancer to make you question if God is good. He's jealous. The devil is jealous of God's glory. He's jealous of your trust in God. He's jealous of your relationship with him. And he is and will speak lies into your heart. Jesus tells the parable of the sower and how the seed can be stolen by the enemy. Paul is bringing that to our attention and saying, whatever happens, you need to realise you're in a battle and you need to stand firm. We don't really have much time to go into uh, deep application of this point, but I do just want to draw very quickly on two things. The first one, just to apply this point, is that we mustn't, if we're in a battle, if there is a spiritual war, then we need to be wise. We need to be careful and we mustn't experiment with anything that would give the enemy, the Bible describes giving the enemy a stronghold, like a foothold. If you're ever climbing a wall and you know how important a foothold is. And the Bible says you and I can do things that would give the enemy a foothold. And so I want to caution us to be careful with the things that we dapple with, especially anything that might be spiritual. I want to warn you and, and caution you because I love Jesus and I love you. Be very careful with the things that you mess around with. Um, but the second application point is that if you're feeling discouraged or weary or bruised, if you're feeling, I would imagine that more than any other year, as you come to the end of this year, that, that would be prevalent amongst us. Just that sense of, of feeling battle weary. Well, Paul, I think, is trying to encourage us by saying, there's a perspective here that might help. There is a battle out there. You're in a war. And so it's, in some ways, it's normal to feel like that. But he doesn't stop there. He tells us to get ready and to stand firm. I used to be a, a rugby coach. Uh, I grew up playing football. Uh, football was my sport. And then as into my adult life, I ended up having to coach rugby in a school in South Africa. And they're all a bit crazy about rugby in South Africa. And one of the things that amazed me when I started uh, coaching rugby was the kind of um, almost the ritual, ritual that the teams would go through before the game. Uh, we never did anything like this in football, but before a game of rugby, and it may just be a South African thing, and that's kind of the culture that I was uh, birthed into in terms of rugby. But before the game, they would like, I mean, there would be some kind of standard stuff where they would do lots of kind of tackling of each other and, and tackling rugby bags and, and hitting each other kind of semi-hard. Um, but then they would do this moment where they would slap each other's cheeks and, and faces and they'd all start hitting each other and slapping each other and, and if this looks crazy on the screen you, that's how crazy it looked to me at the time I remember thinking what on earth are people doing like what why are these teenage boys slapping each other it turns out that there was a reason for it although maybe you could just you could argue with the, the sensibility of it but um, the, the reason that they would do that is because they they didn't want the first contact in the game to be a surprise to them. They, they didn't want their, their, they wanted their skin to feel kind of slap ready. Do you know what I mean? Like they didn't, they wanted their body to feel slightly bruised already. So the first hit didn't hurt quite so much because it, it wasn't a shock to them. And I think Paul is saying, like, that's the deal. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. And stand firm. Be like men. Stand firm. It says in one part of the Bible in Corinthians, it says, act like men, be strong. Maybe this is a, a moment. That's not, not actually not in my notes, that, that passage. But like maybe, maybe, let me just go with the Holy Spirit. I want to say to the men that are here listening to this, the Bible says, act like men and be strong. That's true for women as well. But if the Bible is prepared to single out the men in this moment, then I am too. 
but stand firm in his strength is what Paul says. And uh, it says, stand firm in his strength, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, take up the whole armour of God. Paul's appeal or his encouragement or his charge to stand, that we would stand firm, that we would hold. There's another scene in Braveheart, if you've seen it, where they're, they're holding big long sticks as the enemy approaches and runs onto them and all they're screaming at each other is, hold, hold, hold. How do we hold firm? How do we stand? Well, Paul's appeal is that you and I would lift up our gaze and see Jesus, that we would be strong in the Lord, that we would be strong in the strength of his might, that we would put on the armour of God, and, the, and it says take up the whole armour of God. I love this bit in the passage. It's not your armour. It's not my armour. This isn't a message from Paul where he says, uh, you need to try a bit harder. You need to get up earlier. You need to pray a bit more. You need to, uh, you know, be a bit more disciplined. He, he doesn't even say that this moment is the moment to grit your teeth and dig in. The appeal is the same that he started the letter with when he prayed for us that we would understand the power that is available to us in the cross of Christ, that we would understand the knowledge of the power that is available to us because of Jesus. His prayer is now an instruction. He prayed that we would understand it. He's now saying, put it on. Put on the salvation that comes from God. Put on his righteousness. You know, uh, the, the, the sea in South Africa is, is really quite stormy and quite kind of battering and quite powerful. And uh, there's a... There's, there was a moment when I was in Durban and, and I was just up the coast from Durban and I was uh, swimming in an area that I probably shouldn't be swimming in. Um, and the waves were really strong. And as I went into the water, one of the locals said to me, you really don't want to go in there. It's really strong. And, uh, and I did go in there and I just got battered and smashed and, and I kind of went in and went out as quick as I could. Um, and, and there was a moment where I, I got flipped upside down and I, and I took in some water and I, <laughs> it just wasn't very clever to have been in there. Uh, but it reminded me of a time that that experience reminded me a little bit of um, of when um, my girls were little, when my kids were little, uh, Charlie and the girls, and we would go into the kind of the beginnings of the water in the sea and the waves would come and we would jump over them and it, and it would all be fun. Every now and again, a big wave would come and kind of, you know, hit you hard. And, and sometimes if you got caught in a in a kind of uh, a current or whatever or situation, the waves would get stronger and stronger. And, uh, and, and the kids would start to get scared. And it would be in that moment as the waves kind of hit them and, and kind of were up to my kind of knee level, but their head level as they were toddlers, that I would just scoop them up and hold them tight. And, and I would almost lift them above the wave. They would kind of come up above the waves that were crashing down on us and they were safe. That is the heart of what Paul is saying in this passage. Strength doesn't come from, from your hand holding him. The strength comes from his arm. The strength of God's hand scooping you up and holding you tight. Paul's entire confidence is determined by the cross, the power of the cross. He says it's the same power now is at work in you and I as was at work in Jesus on the cross. And so he says, as I kind of come into close, Paul is encouraging us to look to Jesus, to look to the, to the cross of Christ. Look again at his love for you that's expressed on that cross. The Bible says it was the joy that was set before him that enabled him to endure the cross. Look at him as he was broken and downtrodden. Look how he was despised and rejected and hated. The world had no regard for him. His friends fled and scattered, and he was all alone in that moment. He was beaten, broken, exhausted. And on the cross, he died. God died. Look again at the power of the Father who stepped in in that moment to fight for his son. 
Death couldn't hold Jesus in that moment. On the third day, by the power of the Father, the Son was raised to life. Death couldn't hold him. Your sin and my sin and the sin of the world that was put upon him was dealt with in that moment. The the devil, the enemy's most powerful weapon, death, was defeated and disarmed by Jesus on the cross. Revelations 12 says that we overcome the accuser by the blood of the lamb. See, the father stepped in and raised up his son. And now, no matter how hard life is, no matter how tough it's got, no matter how broken you feel by this year or by whatever it is that you are walking through, the power of the father is there to step in and raise you up raise you up as his son, as his daughter. The same power is at work. He will fight for you. He has strength for you. When the waves of the enemy surround you, when you started to listen to the lies, when you started to hear the enemy's voice, when you stopped trusting God, when you've given up, when you're starting to feel, and I'll be honest with you, there have been moments this year where I've really felt like I've made it sound all kind of holy earlier as I was learning the lessons that the Lord was taking us through. Let me tell you, there were moments where I, I, I stood on a field in, in Bristol and I just cried out, God, what are you doing? Are you even there? I need to hear your voice in this moment because I can't feel you. I can't see you. I don't know why I'm here. And God, in those moments, he reaches out and he holds you. And it's not your strength holding on to him, but it's his strength holding on to you. So I, I want to conclude. I want to again remind you, be alert. Be aware we have an enemy. He's wanting us to, to hear and listen to his lies. We need to take our doubts and our fears and the accusations and the lies of the enemy and the lies of the world around us. And we need to hold the cross up before them. If there was one kind of application that I would want to kind of finish this little bit with, or the end of this sermon with, is is Paul's exhortation right at the end of this passage to pray always, to pray this stuff over each other, to pray, to stand together. Again, another movie that's about battles is, is 300. I don't know if you've ever seen 300, but there's a line in it where it says the strength of a Spartan warrior is not found in his arm, but in the arm of the soldier next to him. And I think Paul, when he says, pray for me, pray for each other, always pray right at the end. I think he's just saying, you know how you do this with each other? You pray for each other. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to close now. I'm going to pray. Um, we're going to sing a song together that I think is all about the cross of Jesus. Is it? Is it that one we're doing? It's about the name of Jesus. About the name of Jesus. Uh, we're going to focus on Jesus again. And, uh, and, and after that, we're going to have a time to pray for each other. And so if you feel like any of this has encouraged you or spoken to you and you want to stick around and, and Richard and I and the others will pray for each other uh, as we do that. So let me pray and then we're going to sing the song as we focus on Jesus. God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the honesty of the Bible. Thank you that we don't live... Uh, with any sense of doubt life is hard we know that we all know that we all know and have experienced something of the toughness of life god we want to thank you for the reminder to lift our eyes away from the, the things of this earth and realize that there is a spiritual battle taking place for our hearts and jesus i want to thank you that in that moment you stepped in my place for me And on the cross, you defeated my enemy. And that I can now know peace in wartime. I can now know a peace that goes beyond circumstance. I can know a joy that goes beyond understanding. And I want to pray for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, I want to pray in the midst of our turmoil and our storms that we would know the strength of the Lord holding on to us and affirming us. We look to Jesus for the source of that strength. Amen.